My name's Rick. I'm alcoholic. It's good to be here this morning. Uh, it's good to see all of you. Uh, <clears throat> honored to be on a panel with Peter. Uh, Peter and I have done stuff like this before. Uh, we come from uh, what I say the same bird bath. Uh, we've been influenced uh, by the same people, uh, heavily influenced by the same people. And uh, the similarity in our message is, well, it can't help but be noticed. Uh, but we're very much like the city mouse and the country mouse. I'll let you guys figure out which one I am. Uh, <laughs> They laugh. That's good when they laugh. That's good. Uh, <clears throat> I think I know what Dale wants us to talk about here, so we'll, we'll just get started on it. And uh, I'd like to ask, uh, if it, how many folks in this room today are sober less than six months? God bless you. Our second step says that we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. And part of the thing I have to start looking at in this, and maybe it's not necessary in the first few weeks or the first few months, but ideas of what's, what's the insanity, right? Or can I even be restored to sanity? That implies that at some point I must have been sane. And, uh, my recollection doesn't have anything to do with sanity. So how I can be, you know, how do I get restored to something that I don't know that I've ever experienced? I said that to a, a, a mentor, what we call a sponsor in AA one time, and he said, oh, he said, you, you were sane. That you were putting on this earth, you were in good sane condition, and things start going south about 20 seconds after the doctor smacked your ass. And, uh, <laughs> Hopefully, we'll build on that a little bit later. So I'm living a crazy life. You know, I'd, I'd kind of known that I was powerless over alcohol for a long, long time, in some degree. I knew that. I knew that, right? I knew from the time that I was 16 or 17 that when I drink, I drink. Now, I didn't have words about allergies. I didn't have that word. I didn't know about a, uh, what the doctor's opinion calls a phenomenon of craving. I didn't... I didn't uh, I didn't know about any of that. I just knew that when I drink, I'm drinking. That wasn't no big deal. People say, you're alcoholic. Hell yeah, I'm alcoholic. Everybody's alcoholic. Ain't no big deal. But then my life started to become unmanageable. And that's a different deal. And what that kind of means is that all of a sudden I couldn't pull off what I used to pull off. That I couldn't think, get things going that used to go. I was always under the idea that that I had made that happen. You know, one of the interesting things, uh, John, uh, the other night, uh, talked about lo looking at, uh, at Bill's story and looking for the similarities. And, and I've done that exercise many, many times. And, and, you know, Bill had this idea that he was good. Some bitch was lucky, what he was. He was lucky. People kept coming around bailing him out. He'd get things going and it'd fall apart and he'd get going again. And he, and, it's, and he ends up saying that I who had thought so well of myself and my ability to surmount obstacles was cornered at last. Right? That's what happened to me. The stuff that used to happen on accident I couldn't make happen on purpose. Right? Our book says when we became alcoholics crushed by a self-imposed crisis that we couldn't postpone or evade. We had to fearlessly face the proposition that God's everything or he's nothing or he either is or he isn't. What's our choice to be? To me, that's the essence of our second step mechanically. But there's a lot that goes into it before that. The preparation, of course, and I, I, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't challenge anybody's convictions or anybody's beliefs, right? If somebody comes and asks me to work with them or asks me to sponsor them or asks me to talk to them about God, we'll just talk. See, because part of the thing that I understand about getting people to come to believe is that we have to meet them exactly where they're at. 
And I don't mean in the jail cell. That's one thing. We can go meet you in a jail cell, but we, gotta, we have to meet you at an intellectual place that you're at. We have to meet you at a spiritual place that you're at. We have to put things in terms that we can all understand. Otherwise, it's like Dale said, it's something happens for somebody else, but it don't happen for me. But when people could meet me where I was at, and helped me to believe, based on my experience, it made everything happen, everything changed. See, I was raised in a Baptist church. I had some prejudice when I came to AA. Uh, I was condem condemned to eternal damnation when I was 13. That's heavy shit. <laughs> you too? Me and you and Bon Scott on the highway to hell, baby, right? <laughs> My friends are going to be there, too. Right? What the Sunday school teacher told me was that if I'd ever smoked cigarettes or uh, drank, and I always liked, he, I, I say, he said, if, you know, if you've ever had sex, and I always like to say, he didn't really clarify if, that, if other people had to be involved with that or not. Uh, <laughs> And that if we had done those things, that unless we went down the aisle of the church upstairs and got saved, uh, we would be condemned to eternal damnation. And I was 13. I was stymied. I had uh, image, self-image issues, right? Terribly bashful. Ter painfully bashful. I never think about how bashful I am naturally. Uh, and when I... Uh, when I'm standing up here in a situation like this and it, and it comes to my consciousness that uh, I just don't know how this happens, that I can stand and speak with you guys because that's not really who I am. I'm a guy that being, <clears throat> being left with the option of walking down an aisle in front of 100 people in a little bitty church and getting saved and being embarrassed or being condemned to eternal damnation I chose eternal damnation, right? Seemed like a long ways away when I was 13. <laughs> what that did was that stuck in my head, right? That I had uh, essentially fingered God, right? And that had come out to play over the course of the next 20 years or so. And I got into AA and I prayed. I prayed once, right? And something happened inside of me, and I didn't know what it was. And I went to a meeting, and I talked about it, and folks kind of made fun of me. And so I made a mental note. Don't talk about praying, and don't talk about God to these people. And I continued to go to meetings. I went to a lot of meetings, right? First six or seven years, I, first six years I was sober, I probably went to four or five meetings a week. After I'd been sober a couple of years, I started going to see psychiatrists and psychologists. When I was sober almost five years, I went to Hazleton for about a month. And I'm not doing very well. I have trouble with folks. I have trouble with my emotions. It's what it says on page 52 of our book. We were having trouble with personal relationships. We couldn't control our emotional nature. We were a prey to misery and depression. We had a feeling of uselessness. We couldn't make a living. We were full of fear. We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of real use to other people. I believe there's probably people in this room that today are suffering from that condition. I was taught, eventually, I learned in Alcoholics Anonymous that not drinking doesn't make that stuff go away. That's the spiritual malady that the effect of alcohol relieves in me. When we take the effect produced by alcohol away from me, I'm left with that stuff. And I start throwing shit around. And I start slamming doors. And sober, I start putting holes in walls. Right? And I go to meetings and I hear people talk about how since they stopped drinking, everything becomes lovely for them. And I'm going, what the hell's wrong with me? Because that's not what my deal is. And I met a man who told me that he thought that I was dying from a part of alcoholism that I didn't even know existed. And he started talking to me about the spiritual malady. And we determined that I'm allergic to alcohol. But then we started looking at the way that my mind worked. And I, 
I started to see that I was in a position where life was becoming impossible, like it says in our book. Right? And I'd passed into a region that they describe on page 24 of our book where they, took, they come up with all these examples of people saying, well, you know, I'll stop with the sixth drink. Right? I'll stop Monday. Or he says, what's the use anyhow? And in common vernacular, I believe, for folks like us, what's the use anyhow means screw it. And then he says, when this sort of thinking is fully established in, an alcohol, in a person with alcoholic tendencies, they've probably placed themselves beyond human aid. And I was in, I've been in that position where I'm beyond human aid. Anything gets a little bit rough, screw it. Don't matter. It don't mean nothing, not a thing. Don't mean nothing. Hell with it. And I lived like that on a daily basis. And on page 25 of our book, it says that, you know, I got to understand that I'd been a part of this fellowship for about six years, but I'd never really been a part of our program. Because our fellowship, our third tradition in the short form guarantees that there's only one requirement for membership to our fellowship, and that's a desire to stop drinking. But there's some of us that the most powerful desire to stop drinking is of absolutely no avail. Doesn't work. And for those of us that come to AA with that condition, there's three other requirements at least. They tell us the self-searching, the leveling of our pride, the confession of shortcomings, which this process requires for its successful consummation. And I'd seen it work in other folks, but it ain't, it ain't gonna work for me. You ain't done what I've done. You ain't, right? God doesn't, not me. God doesn't like guys like me. But then they say this, there was nothing left for us but to pick up the simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet. Right? Before that, they say we had come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life as we had been living it. We were in a position where life was becoming impossible. I'd lived 13 years without any booze or dope. And then I lived 13 years with booze and dope. And then I'd live six years without it again in AA. And I knew this. I don't do good with booze. I don't do good without it. I don't get it. I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. Man, I've tried being a redneck. I've tried being a country boy. I've tried being a hippie. I've tried being a rock star. I've, tried, I've joined the damn country club, for Christ's sakes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know who thought that was a good idea. Really. Right. I've tried being single. I've tried being married. I've tried being celibate. I've tried screwing myself to death. I've tried living poor. I've tried living with money. I've... There's nothing left. I was, I'm grateful that I ha actually had a sponsor that said, what do you got left? See, we went through this book and we literally did what it said to do. And he said, what do you got left? What's left for you but to pick up this kit of spiritual tools? And I could clearly see that I had nothing. There was nothing left for me to try. And I'm grateful that he did that for me because what that did was that opened my mind to spiritual stuff. There's a great, great paragraph, a great sentence in a paragraph in our book that says, don't let any prejudice you may have against spiritual terms deter you from, what they honest, from asking you what they honestly mean to you. It's amazing. That principle, that principle of having an open mind, just, get, just have an open mind, saved my life. It saved my life. See, I, would, I, I had come to believe that when any time I seek some sort of a spiritual power, that it was with some deity that I had been raised with that didn't make me comfortable. I mean, I'm being pretty conservative in saying it didn't make me comfortable. I, I was nervous as hell when people start talking about God. But that sentence, 
Don't let any prejudice you have deter you from honestly asking yourself, what's it mean to you? And as I started to see that I couldn't go on the way that I was, just like it says in our book, if we passed into that region from which there's no return through human aid, we ultimately have two alternatives. One is to go on to the bitter end, blotting out the consciousness of our intolerable situation as best we can. And the other is to accept spiritual help. This we did because we honestly wanted to and we were willing to make the effort. Our book says this. The key word is I'm willing to. I'm willing to seek God. I'm willing to find some sort of spiritual power that's greater than my sense of self. And I can't do that without being devastated. I can't go to the second step of Alcoholics Anonymous in a good mood. Don't work. It don't work. That's an amazing thing. That's why I ask how many of you folks are in here less than six months and there's a small handful of people, right? Unfortunately, you guys are along for the ride today, okay? God bless you. Have fun here. You know, I was pretty young when I got sober. This is the shit that happens if you stick around here, right? <laughs> I got false teeth, banged up knees, terrible shoulders, my back hurts, right? <laughs> But it's the folks that are, that are sitting in this room that have been sober for a long time that have based a belief that we don't understand how our ego rebuilds. And out of that sense of hopelessness and that sense of desperation, my ego starts to rebuild around that. And I no longer need God. And my God starts to become other things. My God starts to become her or the money or the retirement fund or a set of two into one pipes. Maybe a hundred watt orange amp. Or a Gibson Firebird. And these are the things that I think if I can just get them, I'll be okay. The ego starts to rebuild and it separates me from God. In that moment of desperation, I become willing to seek God with all the desperation of a drowning man, like our book says. But what happens is the heat goes away. I'd like to tell you a story about that. <clears throat> Sometime, I guess in 1983 or 1984, I'd been living in, a, <clears throat> in an apartment without any gas or electricity for a while. Uh, I wasn't unemployed. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was making about $16 an hour, and I was an iron worker, a union iron worker. Uh, but I spent money on stuff other than uh, gas and electricity. My daughter asked me one time, <clears throat> Dad, how much money did you spend on booze and dope? Well, that's a good question. I don't know. 13 years of drinking, I mean, well, seems like just damn near all of it, right? <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> a friend of mine and his wife came to my house on a Friday evening, came to my apartment. And I'm sitting around with candles. They thought that was pretty cool. And then he went to the bathroom and said, your light bulbs turn, burn out. And then he went to turn on the kitchen light, and he said, this one's burn out too. <laughs> and then he went to the dining room, and he said, these light bulbs ain't burn out, bro. And I said, no, nah, they ain't. <laughs> and the next morning, about 9 o'clock, he's knocking on the door. And him and his wife come in with cardboard boxes, and I said, what are you doing? They said, we're moving you out of this place. You're not going to live like this, and you're not going to die here. We're going to take you into our basement. And I got to tell you that for the week or so prior to that happening, I was as low as I'd ever been in my life. I was crushed. I was, I'd never imagined that I would live that way. Never, ever imagined that I would live in that kind of conditions. And I was desperate to be changed, but I just didn't see any hope at all. None at all. Couldn't tell anybody about it. Couldn't. I just, then they found out and they moved me into their basement on that Saturday morning. 
And by 11 o'clock that Saturday morning, I've set up shop in their basement. I got, hell, not only do I have water and electricity and stuff, but I got cable TV, right? A couch, and there's a sink down there, toilet. And then Ronnie comes downstairs and he says, look, we're leaving. Uh, we're, we won't be home uh, till Sunday, till tomorrow night. Uh, he throws me a key, he said, this is your key to the house. And he said, the key's in the Sportster. Uh, he, said, so, you know, he said, if you, if you go for a ride, I'd, he, I rode his Sportster a lot. He said, if you go for a ride, he said, don't get all messed up, wrap yourself around a telephone pole or something, okay? Uh, just be cool, we'll see you tomorrow night, brother, I love you. I said, I love you too. And he left. And about 10 minutes after they left, it was a nice day, it was in um, May, probably real warm and I just I just wanted to die and I thought maybe I just need to go out and get my knees in the breeze and blow some dust off just go for a ride out in the country so I went out and started the sportster took off I get about 10 blocks from the house and I go to a stop sign and uh, I gotta give you a little bit of a visual of this that I'm 23 24 years old I'm hair was considerably longer than it is now. Uh, and I'm sitting at a stop sign with this cammed up sportster that ain't got shocks on it, it's got struts on it. And I'm, <laughs> right? And I look to my left and there's three girls in a car in the front seat. And they looked, they did this. <laughs> and I did this. <laughs> that quick ain't nobody I would have rather been than me and that's what happens to me in here the desperation leaves the dying leaves I start to get stuff put together I start to get a car I start to get like John said things start to get built up around me and I get a false sense of security because all of that stuff doesn't treat that internal condition that they describe on page 52. And I'm going to meetings and I'm doing things and I'm just keeping God at a distance. Oh, I may pray, but I'm relying on ritual. I'm relying on, I, I rely on uh, uh, superstition a lot of times. And I use ritualistic prayers. I'm not really seeking a power within me and it starts to fail short one of the things that happened with me and I started to act out in other areas financially sexually this kind of stuff right because I can't stand being me but I can't go to God because of that fear that I have that prejudice that I have and I start looking at things and I start to see that God either is or he isn't, everything or he's nothing. And what that comes out looking for me at that point in that devastation, because the good news is, is I had a sponsor that wasn't afraid to let me go through that. See, one of the things that can happen is I can be very willing to seek God and ready to, 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 to abandon my life to seeking that power, that spiritual power that I believe is within all of us. And folks will come around me and make me better. They'll love me well. And it'll stop me from seeking God. Honestly, just like those girls that grinned at me and waved at me, that'll stop me from being to the point of change. And I need that desperation. And so when I become to the place that I start getting open-minded, now I've got to start looking at some stuff differently than I've ever looked at it before. Maybe those guys in that Sunday school weren't right. Maybe I'm not condemned to eternal damnation. And I start to examine evidence of is God really out to get me? Ties in great with some stuff in the third step. Is God really out to get me or are my troubles of my own making? And what I started to find out was that God doesn't make too hard of terms with guys like me, right? And I started to figure out that maybe this idea of being sane, maybe that's not all that crazy either. And maybe this isn't as much hocus pocus as I thought it was going to be. You see, I believe that I was put here in good, sane, operating condition. 
And along the way, I learned some things. Along the way, I was taught some stuff. Along the way, I experienced some things that took me away from that spiritual being and moved me into an intellectual being. And I started to worship what I thought. And I started to worship things that were, tang that, that, that were material and physical, not things that were spiritual. Page 55 of our book, I think, is a wonderful piece of literature. Right. It told me exactly how and where I'd find God. They say that deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. It might be covered up, right? And I've thought about that, I've thought about that, and I've thought about that. And I, and I don't, for me, this is the great thing about Alcoholics Anonymous. None of you have to agree with me. None of you have to believe what I believe. I have to believe what I believe. Isn't that a great thing? There's people in this room that don't believe what they believe. And I remember being like that. I just want to believe what I believe. And I didn't even have the conviction to do that. But down in every man, woman, and child is a fundamental idea of God. I don't believe, I don't believe at this point in my life that that means that down inside of me is the idea that I have of God. I believe that down inside of me is the idea that God has of me. Right? Otherwise, it's an intellectual process, and I'm creating a God that I understand. But I believe that down inside of me is an idea that God has for me, and, a, and something that a, that a sponsor told me a long time ago is absolutely true. He told me, Rick, God will reveal himself to you as you reveal yourself to you. You start sweeping away, it's like it says on the bottom of page 55. We sweep away prejudice. We, we think honestly. We think diligently within ourselves. The consciousness of our belief is sure to come to us. Right? Well, I believe. But anyway, it says that this stuff may be covered up. This jewel of God that's inside of me might be covered up by pomp, by calamity, by worship of other things, by greed by lust, by authority, by prestige, by power. And I go to those things. Those are the things that I go to to try and make me right. And I seek them with everything that I got. This is my experience. I'm not lecturing. This is what I do. This is how I live in an untreated state. And it always fails miserably. I end up having trouble with folks, and I can't control my emotions, and I'm scared to death, and I'm miserable, and I can't make enough money. And it always falls short. And I get down in the dumps and be prey to misery and depression, and then I get the next great idea. And that's what's going to get it. A Marshall lamp. That's what's going to do it. Actually, I have a peavy. <laughs> All these things are covered up. These things cover up that fundamental idea of God. And they tell me it's down inside of me. It's there. Right? Just as much as the feeling that I have for a friend. They tell me sometimes I might have to search fearlessly. That's how. I'll find God. I may have to search fearlessly. I may have to be fearlessly face the idea that for me to look at God in a way other than I'd been looking at God, I was taught it would be blasphemous. You know what? I got to a place to where I said, you know what? I'm already in hell. And I wasn't drunk. I was sober. And I was in hell. And I was believing in things that I didn't get. I didn't understand it, but I was taught to believe that. You must believe this. It never occurred to me that the prophet Stevie Wonder had said it in about 1973. When you believe in things that you don't understand and you suffer, superstition ain't the way, right? But I believed that stuff and I suffered greatly. And I got to a place to where I realized I had to go with what I could believe. And I'd had help along the way in doing that. People were helping me to tear down the prejudice that I had. So I had to search fearlessly. And they say we found the great reality deep down within us. 
In the last analysis, it's only there that he may be found. I've never sought God anymore since Memorial Day in 1992. On Memorial Day in 1992, I went behind my house and I did an exercise with the book Alcoholics Anonymous. And on that morning, I realized that without the power of God coming into my life, I had just as well go, go rearrange the back of my head with a shotgun. And that I truly needed to find God. And as a result of the exercise that I did that morning, I got down on my knees in the gravel. It's actually cinders in a mud puddle. I just got out of my truck and got in the mud. And I said a prayer in terms that I could understand, some things that I could believe about God. And I'm certain that there's folks in this room today that have a hole in their stomach. I'm certain of it. Most of us have been there a long, long time. Mine got to be about the size of a football. I could actually feel. And on that morning, as a result of that prayer, that hole closed up within me and has never been reopened. And because I'd done what this book had said to do in those first 55 pages or so, 60 including the doctor's opinion, I knew what it was that had happened. I experienced an energy within me. And that hole went closed and I knew what had happened as I was consciously aware of the presence of God within me and I came to believe. I came to believe that God would reveal himself to a person like me. And it didn't look the way that I thought it would. And the approach that I made to God was unlike anything that I'd ever been taught to do before. But it was what I could believe. And on that, and on that experience, it built a cornerstone that I've been following every day since Memorial Day in 1992. I'm a flake. I am. I'm squirrely as hell. Right? Ask anybody that knows me. I'm a squirrel. Right? I'm ADD as all get out. I can't, I'm serious. I had that diagnosis a long time before it came popular, right? They just called it boy back then, right? <laughs> I don't do anything for very long, nothing, nothing. And I stand here in front of God, all of you people, bearing my soul to you to tell you this honest truth that every single day, since Memorial Day in 1992, I've started my day on my knees in prayer. The conviction of the presence of God was so powerful in me that it altered the way that I live, if in no other way than that small task. And I came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. It could unlearn all of those ideas that I'd been taught. It could get me to a place of sanity that I was put here on earth to do, which was nothing more than to love people. Nothing else. Just love people. I have a great life. A great life. I'm never lonely. I'm very seldom scared. I feel terribly inadequate in Alcoholics Anonymous talking about stuff like alcoholism and the power that saves us from that. But without that experience that I'd had, there was no way that I could have abandoned myself to God. Which, by the way, after I experienced the presence of God within me, the decision that God could do with me whatever God wanted to for the rest of my life, that happened about three seconds later. And that's the truth. Once I came to believe, you can do with me as you will. And at that point, I became willing to take steps four through nine. Thank you.